encourage you to turn to John chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. As you find that passage, I want to thank all of you who helped uh, with the July 4th picnic yesterday. What a great time we had. My goodness, a great crowd, and the staff prepared hard. We had a lot of lay volunteers, and it was a beautiful day. Lots of fun and fellowship. Thank you so much for your participation in that, and we look forward to doing that again. I was hoping it might be a first annual, and I think it will be. We are likely going to do that again. So thank you. It was a great, great day. Well, I hope you found John chapter 13. If not, it is on the screen. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There's a story of a woman who had just had enough with her husband. She said, I'm done. The man makes me sick. I'm tired of living with this guy. He is a bum. So she went to her attorney and, and said to him, look, I... I'm sick and tired of living with this guy. He's a jerk, and, and I want to do everything I can to make his life miserable. What can you do to help me to, to give this guy what he deserves? I want a divorce. Well, thankfully, the man that she went to was not just an attorney. He was a Christian attorney. And so he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and for the next two months, I want you to love him like you have never loved make him believe that you have loved him i want you to set this man up we we are going to make him so confused we are going to make him so uh, wrapped up in you and then in two months we're going to drop the bomb on him and tell him we wanted you want a divorce so go home make his favorite meals go out on dates every week reignite your your intimacy with him. I, I want you to take things to work for him, send things to work, whatever it is that you can do, whatever it is that he likes. For the next two months, I want you to, to just convince him that you love him and see at the end of two months when he actually starts thinking that, that you like him, that you love him, we are going to file these papers and smack this man silly. She said, that sounds like an awesome, awesome idea. Two months later, the attorney had not heard from this woman, so he gave her a call and said, I wanted to let you know the papers are ready. She said, shred them. My husband and I have fallen in love. Love is a funny thing, and, and this morning we are considering not just personal love between a husband and wife, but congregational love, what it means for us to love each other. And Jesus in this passage this morning shares one important lesson for us, this less, the first lesson that we would consider today, and it's this, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. Last week I was in one of the Sunday school classes, and they are going through the Gospel of John together. And there was a passage that we're all very familiar with, or most of us are very familiar with. It's a story of Mary who, who enters into the room with Jesus and the disciples, and she pours some expensive perfume on his feet and, and begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair, which had to have been quite a dramatic scene. And, and Judas, recognizing the moment for what it is, begins to, or at least what he thinks it is, begins to condemn this woman. And there she is in a room full of man as a woman, and as such she would have already experienced lesser value. Here's a woman with a checkered past, a woman that, 
that is very familiar with what it means to be a sinner. And, and I am sure there are those in her life that are quick to remind her of her sin. There's a woman who is uh, then challenged by one of these men. And what Judah says is very accurate. This could have been used to feed the poor. She's giving a year's worth of wages. Potentially her entire retirement plan is being poured out at Jesus' feet. And Judas says something that's quite true actually. This money could have been used to feed the poor. And Mary knows that Jesus was, was a man who cared about the poor. And there she is fully exposed all in in that moment. And the thing that captured me in that video was that half second moment what, what happened in her when Judas said what he said? That moment captured me because I think we've been there. Have you ever had that moment when you've made a mistake and you have this gut-wrenching feeling inside? I messed up. And I'm sure she felt that because Judas condemned her in that moment. But I love Jesus' response. Leave her alone what a beautiful moment that anxiousness inside of her heart went away because she knew that that jesus came to her defense she didn't know that jesus knew what it was that was going on in judas's heart but jesus did and he affirmed her as a woman he affirmed her offering he affirmed her gift he affirmed her love jesus responds with a heart of love to this woman we know as Mary. Some of you know what Mary felt like on that day. You, you experience in your own personal life a sense of valuelessness. You, you look at yourself compared to other people that you know and you see a person that you would consider to be less valuable. I grew up knowing something about that. My my family did not have much money, and as such, my clothes rarely fit. I would go to school, and every week somebody would ask me when the flood was coming because my pants were up to there. They just never fit. Every week I was told why I did not measure up. My brother and I would get the cheapest shoes that we could find, and one of the first things we did when we were kids and got a job was go buy Nikes. Because we thought that Nikes meant you were somebody. I wish I would have discovered that Nikes and tennis shoes, cheap shoes, did not define who I am in Christ. Because Jesus loves me. Some of you feel devalued because of your past. You are very familiar with who you once were. And the enemy keeps coming to you to, to remind you at least to try to convince you that you are less than somebody else. Some of you feel devalued because you're finan of your financial position. Some of you feel devalued because, because of how you look or what it is that you can or cannot do. You've convinced yourself that if, if there was a, a game and you were to pick teams and there was an odd number of individuals and the team required an even number, you would be the last one to be picked, which means you don't play the game at all Jesus loves you no matter what people think of you no matter what you think of him will not change the fact that Jesus loves you Jesus loving you does not necessarily mean you are in relationship because to be quite honest you might not believe Jesus ever existed you might not believe that Jesus is legitimate you might hate Jesus for what it is that he is that you believe that he has done doesn't matter Jesus loves you. We can believe Jesus to be a fraud. We can believe any number of things about ourselves. But none of that changes the fact that Jesus loves you. And it is that kind of love that needs to form the foundation of everything that we do in response to that love. Because if we don't come to the terms with the fact that we are loved by Christ then how is it that we are going to know what it means to love others? We have to wrestle with this fact 
that regardless of who it is that we are, regardless of our age, regardless of our socioeconomic status, none of that matters to Jesus. He loves you because you are you, and that forms the foundation of how it is that we live in relationship with other people. So Jesus loves us, and Jesus asks us to love each other. The early church did an amazing job at this, a radical amazing job at this. In fact, the second century historian Tertullian says this about uh, Christians, look how they love each other, how ready they are to die for each other. The Romans were the influencing culture at the time, and they believed that you never did anything for somebody unless they could do something for you in return. So if somebody asks you for a favor, the natural question to ask is, what's in it for me? And yet Christians did not engage in that behavior. They said, I don't care whether or not you can ever do anything in return. I'll lay down my life for you. Now this is enormous considering that in the early church, if a Roman was dying, it was not uncommon for their family to throw them out into the gutter, to die outside the walls of the home. They, they, they did this because in part they saw it as a self-preservation technique. If somebody in my family is dying, I don't want to get what it is that they're dying from. So if I kick them out of the house into the gutter, then my family will not get what my family member has. And so they justify it by saying, I'm saving everybody else in my home by casting out the sick family member. Christians did not do this. They would take cloths and, and, and wet them and try to bring fevers down by putting cold compresses on their head they believed that cleanliness was important so that when sick people were sick, they would, they would wash their body and try to keep them uh, or at least get them well. The end result was that Christian lifespans exceeded the Romans' lifespan. They perpetuated genetic health, antibiotic health, the natural antibodies, and I'm not a doctor, but you get what it is that I'm saying. If you overcome something... You pass it on to your kids, and then they have immunity to it. But the Romans didn't. They just cast their loved ones out. They took risks to care for each other. The, in, the epistle, in the epistle to Diog Diognetus, we read these words, quote, regarding Christians, they dwell in their own countries, but only as aliens, as citizens, they share in all things with others, yet endure all things as foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native land, and every land of their birth is as foreign land to them. They are in the flesh, but they don't live according to the flesh. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death, but restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. When punished... They rejoice as if by it they are brought to life, end quote. Where did the disciples get this way of thinking, this way of living where they radically engaged in love for each other? Well, they got it from Acts chapter 2, verse 42, which says, quote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer, all the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, before you get too nervous, I'm not advocating that we all quit our jobs, sell our property, go out in the soccer field and sing Kumbaya all day long. It's not what I'm suggesting. But, but I think that the scriptures need to shape how it is that we live in relationship with each other. We are called by Christ to inconvenience ourselves for the sake of our brothers and sisters who are here this morning. How often do you inconvenience yourself for others in the community of faith that we call Greenville First Nazarene? 
Do you inconvenience your sake for the other? When someone is missing, do you care? When someone is in need, does it motivate you to act? It's not enough for us to say, well, somebody else will do it. In a church this size, somebody else will care. Folks, when you have been in need, did you ever say, I've had enough love, I don't need any more? Have you ever said that? No. So, okay, 20 of us call somebody that is hurting and say we're praying for them. Is that too many? Why is it that we allow our culture to shape what it is that love means? The, the scriptures call us to inconvenience ourselves for the sake of each other. We are called to love with a radical love that is born out of the love that Jesus has shown to us. Why does this matter so much to God? Why does he care about this so much? It's because of the third idea of the morning. The, that idea is that love and witnessing are inseparable. Love and witnessing are inseparable. God in his wisdom has placed a, a powerful connection here, folks, between how it is that we love each other and the witness of the church. Jesus says, the nature in which you love each other is tied to what it is that our world believes about us as disciples, as Christ followers. Those two things are inseparable. The way in which we love each other will have an implication on the life of our church. The way in which we love each other is going to have an implication on our witness in the community. In Acts chapter 2, we read that the result of their love for each other, the, the result of the depth of their love for each other, meant that people were being added to the church daily. People were being saved every day because of the way in which they loved each other. The natural, or better yet, supernatural outflow of how it is that we love each other is that people get saved. Now, how's that for an evangelism program? If you want people to be saved... Love each other. If you, if you want people to come to faith in Christ, love each other. When God's church, or any particular church, ex experiences decline, one of the places that you have to take a pulse for is the nature of the love of the people for each other in that community of faith. I've been your pastor for 12 weeks now. On Thursday, we'll have reached the 100-day mark. Time is flying, at least for me. <laughs> I'm still very new, still very much in a state of discovery. I don't know the answer to this question about the nature of our love yet. I've seen some positive signs, but I don't have a clear vision of the depth and nature of how it is that we are loving each other yet. But if I were to ask 20 of you the answer, to, ask, to answer the question, how are we doing at loving each other, I would probably get varied answers. So let me ask this. Has anyone in our community said, I have, I have to find my way to Greenville Nazarene because I have heard how it is they're loving each other over there? Anybody say that? Their, their love over there is so radical, so deep, so driven, purposeful, intentional. When somebody has a need in that church, they will inconvenience themselves for the other. If somebody is hurting, they are, they are just loved like I've never heard anyone loved before. D do they say that about us? Our love and our witness is inseparable. People have been so worked up over the SCOTUS ruling. I haven't. Not been afraid at all. Somebody asked what I thought the legacy of President Obama was going to be. They were expecting a bunch of negative answers. I said, I pray that his legacy is that he is the man who God used to awaken his church. You see, I'm not concerned about SCOTUS or their ruling. 
or what the states allow or do not allow. I'm more concerned that 10 years from now, sociologists will do a study and determine that you are more likely to be happy in your marriage if you marry someone of the same gender. And if they look at Christians, they would say, if you really want to be miserable, be married and attend church regularly. That's a problem, folks. Because currently, being a Christian and being married doesn't matter to our relationships. Why? It's because we create in the culture of the church the idea that it is unsafe to speak about any struggle in our love for each other. We don't create that safe environment to say, you know what, I am struggling in my love. Let's look at it this way. People 15 to 25 years old are very interested in spirituality. Very interested in spirituality. And, and they're looking for something spiritual that will meet the inner need of their life. And if they don't find it where they are, they tend to then go to the place where everybody else goes, which is usually a mega church with uh, vibrant, dynamic worship services, flashy lights, music programs, and all that stuff. The problem is our 15 to 25-year-olds are not finding anything of lasting or meaning there either. The only churches that, that churches that are born out of an attraction model are attracting are other people who are already following Christ, generally speaking. But 15 to 25-year-olds have come to the conclusion that for the last 20 to 30 years, all the church has demonstrated is that Christianity doesn't matter very much. It doesn't matter in our love. It doesn't matter in our marriages. It doesn't matter in our parenting. It doesn't matter in what we do Monday through Saturday. Christianity is largely irrelevant, and they are desperately seeking for a relationship with Christ that matters, and they are not finding it here, being the local church. Not speaking to our church in particular, but, but in the church, are they finding a faith, a relationship with God that matters? We say a whole bunch of things on Sunday that really don't matter Monday through Saturday. And I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming me. Folks like me. I'm blaming the, the leadership of the church, me, for that. The leaders of the church have a responsibility to create the culture and climate for healthy marriage. My wife and I are going to be teaching a marriage seminar in the fall and into the winter. And you know what couples will do? They'll attend and say, well, are people going to think that my marriage is in trouble? If I go to that, well, people say, oh, they, they must, they must uh, need help in their marriage. I wonder what's going on at home. And then, if two years later we teach it again, then somebody really can't go because they must not have learned anything the first time. <laughs> you, see, you see what I'm saying about the culture and climate that we need to create? Why is it that we can't instead say, Praise the name of Jesus. That is a husband and wife who wants to do everything in their power to build a marriage founded on Jesus Christ, and they're going to do everything they can to make that happen. We need to create that culture, folks. To create this safe culture where, where life begins to matter. So what is it that churches tend to do? We, we focus on Sunday. We focus on church wall-driven programs. And, but yet 85% or more of your life is not lived here. It's lived at home with your spouse. It's lived at home with your parents. It's, it's lived at work with your coworkers. It's lived in the neighborhood with neighbors that, that bless you or annoy you. And, and how many times do we speak to those matters? Almost never. 
We keep talking about what happens in here. So Christ's followers continue to struggle in their marriage, continue to struggle in their parenting, continue to struggle in their workplaces, continue to struggle in their community. How is it that we can expect anyone to know how to love appropriately in those contexts if we don't wrestle with what it means to be a Christ follower who loves in those contexts? Since our love and witnessing are inseparable, my wife and I are committed helping you have the tools, the training, the opportunity that God would transform our love together. That your homes would take on new understanding. That your homes would take on new ideas about love. That your marriage could, could be transformed by the Spirit. That, that it would be safe for one couple to approach another couple to say, you know what, can we hold each other's feet to the fire where one man tells another man, how are you doing in loving your spouse? Where a woman can tell another woman, how are you doing in loving your husband? And be honest and real with each other and spur each other on toward love and good deeds? Can, can you at least say, in principle, I am committed to joining pastor and creating that culture at Greenville First Nazarene? People will find Jesus as we do. We need to wrestle with what it means to be a Christian at work, what it means to be a Christian in a neighborhood so we can love well in those contexts. Now, we're not going to resolve all of this overnight. You don't change culture overnight. And so this is going to take some time, but we need to begin somewhere. And we begin in our homes and our relationship with our families and our relationships with our coworkers. We, we can experience what it means to love well in the name of Christ. So God's been drilling this in my own life this week. New application for me. What's the pastor doing? You know the Church of the Nazarene does not condone what it is that SCOTUS has done this past, uh, these past 10 days. But our beliefs do not give us permission to be belligerent. So I contacted my gay roommate. God asked me to say this to him. For the, for the ridicule you heard as a child, for the mocking words you heard in college, for the violence expressed towards you, for the anger expressed against you over the past week by Christians, I am sorry. I know you're probably going to tell me that you don't think I should be the one to apologize, but I do, so I am. I am sorry. He said, quote, I feel like I've seen some of the worst, but I also believe that's why God put you in my life. If anyone can make a difference, I truly believe it to be you. I spoke with my wife this week. I apologized to her that in the last three months I've been obsessed with my job, with my calling. I've not been as present in our home as I should have been. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about Greenville first. I get ready for the day, Greenville first. Shower, Greenville first. Drive, Greenville first. I'm in here, Greenville first. I go home, Greenville first. I go to bed, Greenville first. And I do it again for the last 96 days. Well, that probably preceded that because I was doing that before I even moved here. <laughs> I said, Miriam, I realize that I've not been present to you or to our children like you deserve. And I'm probably not just going to flip a switch and it's all going to change overnight, but I am committed to doing better in our home to loving you like you deserve to be loved, to giving you the attention that you deserve to receive from your husband. I don't, I don't want you to leave here saying, oh my goodness, the pastor and his wife's relationship is falling apart. That is not the case by any stretch of the imagination. My children can witness to that. You have my permission to ask them. But why is it that we would want to wait till it got there? Why is it that we would 
we would settle for second best love in our homes? Why can't we repent along the way before things ever get in trouble? Why settle for mediocre? I need to love Miriam well because it matters to God. It matters to our witness. It matters to the witness of the church. It even might matter to somebody that needs to be saved. What what does our love say about our witness? If it's poor, it might be my fault. And I want you to know that I'm going to do what I can as your pastor to create a culture in our community of faith where it's safe to say that we're struggling, where we can surround men and women that are struggling, not with words of judgment or condemnation, but with encouragement and support and love so we can, we can present them to Christ who would transform our love together. I want to be a part of that kind of church. Uh, We're not going to fix it overnight, but we will do everything in our power together. Uh, Me in relationship with our staff and the leadership of the church, we will model this with our spouses, our children, our co-workers, our neighbors, our guests. We will love in Jesus' name. So what can you do? I hope that today you leave with an introspective look. How is my love? How is my love for my family? How is my love for my coworker? And and in the context of this message, how is my love for the people that are in this room or or for the others who are a part of our community of faith who are on vacation or traveling today? What is the nature of my love for them? And as God brings someone to mind, you, you don't assume that somebody else will do something about it. You do something about it. The reason God brought them to your mind is because he wants you to do something about it. So will you do it? You cannot fix everything, nor will everything come to your mind. But just this morning before church, I became aware of a situation. I put it in my phone. I put an alarm to it. So that at some point this afternoon, my phone is going to go off to remind me that God had brought that situation to my mind. And I'm going to be making a phone call later today. We can develop those kind of habits where instead of forgetting and then regretting it later, we can create habits in our life that allow us to remind, that, that, that bring remembrance to our mind so that we do something about loving each other. Don't dwell on what you haven't done. Commit to doing things differently. And the Spirit, who is faithful, will call us to love. Do you believe that? I do. Father, thank you for these lay people at Greenville First Nazarene. I'm growing to love them, Father. I know they love each other, at least principally. They they love each other in principle. I don't... I've not been here long enough to see their love in action, to see how it is that it materializes. But I pray, Lord, that we would hear in the days to come. I have heard about Greenville First Nazarene, not because of their programs, not because of their worship, not because of their age group ministries, as important as all of that is. I pray that someone hears about us because of how it is that we love each other. Because if that is the reason, someone is about to be saved. So I pray that you would draw to our attention those that we know that need a little bit of love today that we would engage in personal strategies so that we would not forget to take action as your spirit leads us. And we will praise you that Greenville First Nazarene becomes the church in Greenville County that is not known by its worship, by its programs, but by its love. Make it so in us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.